Hi guys, Nigel here with you, Nigel's Modeling Bench, with another book review. And this is now number 17, is it, in the um, pictorial series. So, basically, in here is a Wing Leader Productions, Wing Leader Publications book. And I know what it is, it's the latest one that's out, and it's the one I've been looking forward to. It's the third Lancaster book, and this is all the late lengths. The, 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 well, I say the late legs, this is going to be all about the dam busters and the tall boys and all that. The reason I haven't opened it, I've cut the bag open, so I can not have to do it on screen. But this, I always talk about the packaging that you get if you buy your book direct from Wing Leader Productions. And this is basically how it comes. So you've got a plastic bag, so come rain or shine, you know your book's going to be okay. In the plastic bag is a card envelope. Or card envelope, should I say. And the reason I'm showing you this is I recently bought a book on the Yamato uh, from Amazon and it came in a jiffy bag. It came in a bag like that, just the book. So when it came, so it wasn't Amazon, it was a Tiger, a tiger Tank, Jag Tiger book. And it, when it came, every corner of the book was damaged because it was just put in a bag. So I, for me, the packaging, especially with books, is very important. So we've got the book here in a stiff cardboard envelope. Okay, so there's another layer of protection, and then it's also wrapped in bubble wrap. So it's a bubble wrap bag, which is sealed, as you can see. So the book arrives to you, number 18, sorry. We need a photo archive number 18. The book arrives to you in perfect condition, and there may also be, no there isn't. So as you can tell, because I've just opened it on camera, I haven't looked at this book at all. So this is going to be a great review. We can enjoy the surprise together. So we can see on here, as I say, number 18, there's a full series of these books. Go back and have a look. I've reviewed all of them. Um, this is part three. So we've got the Mark, the Mark II, the Mark VI, the Mark X, the Type 464, which was the Dam Buster, B1 Special, 42 to 45. So it's covering the whole period of the war with all these different uh, uh, different Lancasters and I'm going to stop and realign my lighting because we've got loads of glare because of all the lovely glossy pages. Okay so here we are Wing Leader Photo Archive number 18 the author of this book, people, the um, contributor to this book is Peter Allen um, and it's on the Avro Lancaster and this is part three so we're looking at the Mark II, the Mark VI's, the Mark X's, the Type 464 and the B1 Specials so that's be one special there. Um, 1942 to 1945. So we can see on the back here we've got wingleader.co.uk which is where as I said you want to order it from to guarantee your great packaging and then you've got the ISBN number there should you wish to look somewhere else and you've got the recommended retail price there £19.95 pence, which I find absolutely amazing because when the first one of these um, photo archive books came out in 2020, I think a pint of beer in my local was about £3.20, and now it's £4.20. So the fact they've kept these the same price is absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. So nice images on the front there, and we'll see more of this as we go into the book. And then opening up the book here, we've got inside the front cover, Welcome to Number 18, and it's talking about how this book follows up from the early and the late Lancasters and what it's actually covering. Peter Allen, who's the guy who's um, who's basically authored this book, he's a professional aircraft engineer and the son of a wartime Lancaster pilot. So he is an Lancaster expert in every sense of the word and his in-depth knowledge was really needed with this one to pull out details on the lesser known examples. Um, as with all the books in the series, they've enhanced, enhanced photos to pull out the shadow detail and have added arrows and letters to identify points of interest, which they do beautifully. And no doubt we'll also have the, the modelers bits as well, which is wonderful. Where it tells you that, you know, this model had the shimmy wheel, it had the black tail turret, it had these guns, it had this, you know, it, absolutely brilliant. Um, they're also looking cons considering a fourth wartime book that covers internal and electronic equipment as well as bomb loads and crew clothing. That'll be interesting. So that'll be good to see. Um, crew clothing, not crew loathing, as I said. So there we go. Some in information there about wing leader and everything. And then uh, some information there about the aircraft that we can see, or the aircraft that we can see in these photographs. So going over the page here, first of all, we've got the um, Lancaster Mark II. And 
The Lancaster Mark II is this one with the radial engine, the Hercules engine, and it was basically built as an insurance against, I'm just reading this out here, against possible Merlin engine supply interruptions. So um, that's what it was done, that's what it was done for. Um, they, they constructed 300 examples, um, and pictured here is the A and AEE 1942 Sol Mark II prototype. And this one, as you can see, has got the air intakes in the uh, in the wing leading edges. And they were for the cabin heating, which subsequent Mark II's didn't have because they didn't have the radiators in the wings. And here you can see they've got the longer um, carburetor intakes on the top. You can see them here as well. The really long carburetor intakes, carburetor intakes over the engine. And there's a beautiful picture there. Again, you can see the P on the side for prototype. And this is obviously in the daytime camouflage as well with the... Uh, brown and green and the um, light grey undersides so uh, very very attractive looking aircraft and you can see here it's also got the um, this is before they started painting the inside of the turrets in black you can see the aluminium frames there and then um, here you go we got the large uh, type A underwing round or stand out from the D10 oh this has got the yellow underservices of course because it's a prototype it would have been yellow sorry but not the uh, not the light grey uh, that's later like you can see here. Um, so they've got, uh, was fitted with several items of production equipment including standard beam approach whose marker, marker beacon dipole aerial is visible under the rear fuselage. So you've got there the tower rail underneath the fuselage there. Um, and we can see here they're pointing out with the arrow, what are they pointing out? The trailing aerial shroud can be seen in later position and curved cabin heating hot air pipes from the arrowed are visible running from the aft ends of the inboard engine flame dampeners into the cells. So that's how they got their um, their cabin heating was from the exhaust on these, not from the uh, from the water. And here you can see the, uh, the turret has no guns in it. So the early Lancasters had a ventral turret which was on and off and on and off and then just abandoned I believe. Um, so early production Mark II's with Hercules six engines uh, both feature long carburetor intakes you can see them there great big long intakes on the carburetors um, unpainted cowl gills okay, you can see them there uh, original position trailing aerial should be back here and, and standard Bombay doors rather than the bulge ones Although only two serial numbers apart, DS602 has the earlier grey trestle markings as opposed to DS604, later standard dull red. So the uh, 604 here has the dull red and that has the light grey. So you've got a really good um, point there where they changed over. Um, so that's all about that one. And then here we've got a beautiful image here. Uh, this is one January day in 1943. It says down here January 43. Um, Illustrates several early production features, including rounded propeller tips, light coloured structure within the FN50 mid turret and FN rear turrets, 60 inch G whip air in its original position, protruding through the canopy, and smooth tread tile, smooth tread tail wheel tyre. That's a mouthful. So you can see there, that's the early type tail wheel. You can see this is a fairly newish looking aircraft. It doesn't look that weathered, does it? As opposed to this one, look at that one, that one's really beat up. Um, this is in the special night, we've, we've talked about this before. The special night matte black finish is applied to many early aircraft. It weathered very badly and as you can see, it's stained, it's blotchy, it looks bloody great, doesn't it? And it's all chipped and flaking off. So you can see there, there's a Mark II, for the, all with the windows and the fuselage and the early type turrets and everything. So all looking really good. It'd be lovely to build one, a model of one of those in 30 seconds ago, wouldn't it? That would really be an eye catcher. Um, then we've got DS-606, nicely illustrates the unpainted cowl gills, you see there, um, and the 60 inch G whip aerial sticking up out of there, and we've got the um, the SBA main signal receiving whip aerial can be seen just half of the trailing aerial shroud, there's your trailing aerial shroud there, and there's the aerial underneath. Here we've got them fitted now with a shimmy wheel, and apparently this was taken from a Hampton, yeah, from the dorsal gun position of a Hampton. RMD 2A special night was frequently applied over a first coat of DTD 308 smooth night and you can see that the uh, old, the uh, newer paint is showing through. Um, DS652 KOB of 115 squadron sports a mixture of early and late Mark II features. Propeller spinners which was late obviously. Uh, this has got the longer intakes. Uh, you've got the um, 
barrage balloon cutters there. We've got uh, plain forward sections on the flame dampeners. Uh, U-shaped oil coolers, whatever that means. Uh, second style of glow nozzles, so that'll be the, the covers over the glow code nozzles on the, um, for the windscreen there. Um, and unlike their Merlin powered counterparts, Mark II's never received the Mod 780 deepened bomb aimers blister or Mod M883 repositioned pitot tube. So there we go. So be careful when you're modding a Mark II, make sure you get the right bits on it. Here we can see the shorter carburetor intakes, not rather than the great big long ones. And here you can see this one's got a windowless fuselage. Interesting. Yeah, also is the absence of the fuselage windows. That's a bit unusual. And here we can see this picture here showing obviously the um, turret is gone. And reading down in here, I've seen this picture before. Yeah, it was uh, the turret was severed by falling bombs over Cologne on the night of 28th, 29th of June, 43. The rear gunner, 21-year-old Sergeant Jeffrey White, was lost without trace. God rest his soul. And um, you can see here what they're talking about there is the fabric covering over the, the turret fairing. The fabric um, covered elevators and they're talking about the uh, IFF aerial for the later one. That's the later IFF antenna. Although they still kept the um, the wires, the cables to go into the training edges, because the leading edges of the um, tailplanes. Here we can see, this is great, you can see there we've got a, a very good image of a stress skin effect. So those of you that think the, um, the wing nut wing kit is overdone, there we go. It's also got unusual positioning of the uh, of the letters there, they should be further forward. There's another Mark II there, and we've got here. We've got the um, you can see there we don't have the plain forward section on the flame dampeners. The porcupines are called, aren't they? Or hedgehogs, I can't remember now. Uh, this one here is being maintained, it's having another bomb added to its tally, it's having some work done on the engines. Um, this one's here starting to raise its undercarriage, that's what they're saying there. We've got a lovely, lovely view here. So we've got the little, um, we've got the aerial insulators. We've got the uh, dipole aerial there, the tower rail. We've got a uh, Monica there on the on the back. And then A here is showing us, doo -doo 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 -doo, where's A? Oh, that's what this, that's right. This one's got no windows there, look. You can see we have windows here. We have windows here, but no windows in the, wing section so uh, as I was saying or you haven't seen the video yet but um, talking about the wing section there on the Lancasters in my part 30 video that's coming up um, that's the wing section there with no windows so you can see that section that section all with windows and that one without another image there this is a crew just about to get going and on their way um, this aircraft was abandoned by its crew after running out of fuel returning from Berlin in December 43 Coming to Earth in a North York Moors peat bog. I wonder if they dug her out. Here we've got Fanny Furkin 2. <laughs> um, JIF of 514 Squadron about to touch down for a 1944 exchange visit to Station 128, home of the B-17s of the 401st Bomb Group. Um, she has a blanking paint over the ventral turret position and a monocular aerial. And there she is again in close-up. You can see here all the Americans are having a good look at the Bombay thinking, wow, that's big. <laughs> uh, and then here we've got the wonderful, which is what they do in these books, which I absolutely love. We've got the um, the sort of the, the artist's rendition there, which is absolutely beautiful. And then here you've got all the notes for the modeler. So if you want to build that aircraft, this is all your notes. Silver wheel hubs, very common on Mark II's, stuff like that. Over the page here, we've got the... Um, RF Bomber Command wasn't the only major user of bicycles during the war. Uh, later star window. <laughs> we've got loads of bikes here, look. <laughs> um, and you can see here we've got the... Uh, that is the... Do, do, I'm looking for where it says arrow. The mandrel, that's the name I couldn't remember. It's got the... looks unpainted as well. Mandrel aerial on there. Here we've got repair going on to the, um, to the flaps. Looks like something's gone through, probably shrapnel. And you've got a little trim tab there on the um, aileron, not to be confused with the servo tab there. In the background, we've got a couple of aircraft here waiting for repairs. We've got Halifax over there as well. And then here they're painting the, the nose art, Zombie Z, Zombie Z. The 514 Squadron was on a practice. Oh, that's this one here. 
this was on a practice flapless landing um, in Suffolk. Uh, it was declared cat E written off. Note the uh, wooden propeller blades shattered rather than what you normally see with them, them bent. And there's a beautiful picture there of a Mark II. Absolutely gorgeous. Very, very nice. And it's got the gun. It's got a, a 0.5 gun mounted underneath, which you actually get in the Border Models kit. You get that gun. You don't get the fairing, but you get the gun. Now we're on to the Mark VI. Um, so in order to facilitate service trials of the two-stage Merlin and Universal Power Plant, planned for Avro, Lincoln and Tudor Airliner, commencing in late 1943, Rolls-Royce Hucknall. That's interesting. I was going to go and work there. When I worked at Rolls-Royce in Bristol, I was facing redundancy or they would offer me a job at Hucknall. And I went up to Hucknall and looked around I didn't want to go. So I left. Um, that's interesting. So they did uh, nine Lancaster Mark III's, thus converting them to Mark VI's. Although engine handling and service were found to be problematic, the Mark VI showed a noticeable performance increase over a standard Lancaster. While some aircraft were retained for development work by Rolls, several Mark VI's, like, like JB675 seen here, served in PFF squadrons, whatever PFF stands for. Here we go, I did a video about acronyms the other day, didn't I? Um, Designed to simplify manufacturing and reduce costs, the circular constant cross-section of the Rolls-Royce Universal power plant is seen to good effect. So what they did was actually built a complete engine with propeller, spinner, cowling, everything, the cell, so it could just bolt on so you'd have a universal engine, which, uh, which was a really good idea, if you ask me. And we can see there's a normal um, Merlin-powered Lancaster in the background there, by the look of it, perhaps an undergoing conversion. It's uh, ugly, very ugly, I think, but... Um, you know, it's part of the Lancaster's history. We can see here there's four of them there in all sorts of different... You've got the airliner type nose there. We've got a fared off nose there. Um, left bottom, this is DV170, was used by Rolls-Royce for UPP development work. And the top one is DV199, was used for trials of the Merlin 100 series engine. I'll have to look that up and see what that was. And then here we've got a photograph um, of an aircraft awaiting the scrap. And that's this one here, F2V, so uh, ND673. We can see here she's got um, letters on the underside of the wing there. You can see them up there. Farmer 1946. And they're saying there, although, although these two views, although of great interest, these two views do not accurately represent an operational March 6 from 1944. So what they're saying here is basically don't look at any of that and think, you know, they didn't have... Uh, spinners or they didn't have this or they didn't have that ignore it because it's they've probably been cannibalized for parts um, after conversion to a mark 6 nd784 was allocated to frank whittle's power jets so they're doing jet tests engine jet tests there but it does say here uh it, it's of note it's still got the bombing was equipment in there uh, but you can see the fared off nose turret there now we're on to the mark 10 the canadian beauty and this is where they um they sent an aircraft over to Canada and the Canadians sort of reverse engineered it and, uh, and built a Lancaster. Well, they obviously had drawings and stuff as well, but the Canadians built Lancasters for us to use against uh, Germany in the war, which was very nice of them. Um, Avro built Mark 1 R5727 was flown to Canada in four, August 42 to act as a pattern aircraft and a senior just taken off from Montreal's Dorval Airport flying over the downtown on her way to her next stop at RCAF Rockcliffe, Ottawa. And there we go. There was Canada quite built up and populated by the look of it. Um, here we can see that's, that's showing us the IFF antenna. Remember I showed you one earlier here, down here, but the, that's the early IFF. Interesting to see the painted out windows as well. This is the Ruhr Express, KB700, um, and this plane was, was used as a, a very big, um, a very big uh, promotional thing, wasn't it, Ruhr Express? Um, you can see we've got the TR9 aerial plate there, but we don't have a cable because it was superseded. You can see it's KB700, lots and lots of pictures of her. You can see they're all looking lovely in here, we're starting to get a bit dented and worn and stuff. And there we go, we've got the crew there with a, with a puppy, <laughs> a little, little dog on his lap. And then here we've got a picture here showing the operation of the, uh, of the ventral gun, which looks very uncomfortable, I must say. Um, here we've got S for Smitty. Uh, 419 Squadron has given the gun an attempt to, her, to free her left main wheel. So 
stuck in the um, in the mud there. So they're trying to get it out of the mud. Interesting as well to see that the bomb, the bomb painting on the I can't remember what it's called now. Um, the bomb tally, that's the word I was looking for. The bomb tally is painted on in the form of the word love. Unusual. Uh, lovely aerial view there. You can see the um, the uh, dinghy hatch there marked off with the with the red paint around the edges. You can see here some lovely wartime pictures. Here's one having a engine replaced by the look of it. They're refitting the prop, and you can see there the Canadians had the um, the decals and transfers still on the propellers, whereas the English painted over them, removed them, didn't have them in the first place or whatever. But. Uh, very nice indeed. There, <laughs> got the uh, nose art there. It says recent photo underneath. You've got the bomb tally there. That's quite far forward. Normally it's back here, isn't it? Very nice. And this is um, P for panic. N A P. P for panic. And you've got panic in painted over the door there. So uh, Toronto, here we come. <laughs> so um. Seen after arriving back at her Moulton birthplace in June 1945, displays a multitude of homecoming paintwork embellishments. Unlike the British counterparts, no marked hens were ever modified with downward vision blisters or the bliss or all right or the blisters replacement flat oval plexiglass panel. That's interesting. No marked hens had the the round panel and the new or the oval panel. Unusual. Um, some more nice colour pictures there. Some more time colour pictures. This is N A G, N A A. Looks like those flaps are black. Right, on completion of the 100th Lancaster built by Victory Aircraft, KB799. Well, that's interesting because we missed out numbers, didn't we? The British built, they didn't like build sort of W1, W2, W3, they went 1, W1, W3, W7, and missed some out to make it like they built more than they had. But it looks like the Canadians just built them in series because the first one was 700 and the last one was 799. This one here, 799. Uh, the first production marked hens were fitted with three turrets during manufacture, but as seen here, fabric covered wooden fairings were soon substituted. Uh, turrets then being installed on the arrival in the UK at 20 MU Aston Down. That was probably to increase their range to get them flying here in less stints. Makes sense, doesn't it? Or maybe the Canadians struggled with the manufacture of the turrets and we said, send them without them. We'll have them without them. We'll do them ourselves, don't worry. So you got more modelers' notes, paddle bladed props, later star pito tube, gloss paint on nose and spinners. This is something that gets talked about a lot in here. Um, delivered with bulge bob doors, these tend to be replaced by standard ones once in England. H2S usually added in the UK. So again, if you're building a Canadian aircraft and you're having it before it came over here, no turrets, no H2S and bulge bomb bay doors. Here's a lovely picture here. KB-783 became the trials aircraft for 50 cal more in mid-upper turret. There we go. There's the mid-upper turret there. And you can see here there's the side intake for the uh, heater. And interestingly on this picture here, uh, you will see... Is it in this picture? There we go, yeah. The absence of an air intake and the left-hand inboard leading edge confirms this aircraft has the modified cabin heating system installed. So this is the modified cabin heating system, which, which PA-474 has, the uh, Battle, of, Battle of Bitten Memorial flight aircraft, has that. Um, no left-hand intake in there. This one here is showing us we've got um, trestle markings there, painted underneath. We've got... Um, Teardrop fairings over the uh, over the fuel pumps. We've got landing lights there. We've got the uh, ventral turret there, and then we've got the um, the uh, three downward identification lights. I can't remember the name. I, I was going to call them formation lights. Um, downward facing identification lights. So that's all cool. Also got some lines painted on the tail planes there as well. Going over the page. KB783 was sent to Boscombe Down for evaluation of the Martin mid upper turret. Uh, she was built and delivered to the UK with the later style bulged bomb, bomb, later style bulged bomb doors with smoothly fared forward contours. Intended to counter attacks from below, Mod 925 approved in February 1944 installed a free mounted 50 cal calibre machine gun, the unpainted frame from which is, is visible. 
You see here a gloss painted nose. It's really unusual on these Canadian lanks. They had a gloss painted nose on them. So that's uh, interesting. And they've also got WT and DT D, WT and DTD stencils, which denote the uh, the paint that was used. Going over the page here, we can see we've got uh, ice protectors, ice guards on the carburetors. And then here is that great big window chute, which you get in the uh, Wingnut Wings kit, um, which is nice. So uh, interesting, you get that. And then going over the page here, we've got some more pictures, some more time with some different painted, strange uh, lettering there. See the H2S down there with the clear part in it. And there we go, we've got some more Canadian lanks there. And here we've got white wall tyres. We've got a white ring in the roundel on the top. I'm assuming this is post-war. So uh, yeah, all, all tarted up looking lovely. You see the white wall tyres <laughs> looking very nice indeed. We've got the, uh, the air vents there painted over as well. So here we're now onto the interesting stuff. Type 464 provisioning. This is the, um, well it's all interesting stuff isn't it? This is the uh, dam buster light. You can see you've got the uh, upkeep bomb racks there. Um, and we can see we've got the ventral gun position still there. And we've got the tower rail. And it's got Monica. Just reading down here, 23 Lancaster Mark 3s were converted, EDA17 being the second of three prototypes. In common with all upkeep aircraft, the mid upper turret has been removed and replaced with a crudely doped painted sheet metal panel. And although not fitted with an actual gun, the aircraft has the ventral machine gun position arrowed. Interesting. Interesting to see the weathering on those engines as well. Here we can see G aerial. And this one's at um, Boscombe Down prior to chastise. All type 464s were built with fuselage windows, left hand canopy, observation blister, 60 inch G aerial in the rear of the canopy and Macart Packard Merlin 28 with needle blade props. In case you remember that. Uh, in common with other upkeep aircraft, ED825 also has the later more deepened bomb aimers blister within which can be seen an automatic bomb site Mark II mounting frames and rectangular adapter plates. So that's going to be up in there and you can see it over in there as well. Um, so there we go. So that's all interesting. You see here that, that C there is denoting the scratch. There's a cable that comes down, an emergency manually release cable for the for the upkeep, upkeep if, the, if the electronic system failed. We can see here we've got aluminium turret internals and the light green inside the nose area there as well. You can see here the bombs being dropped and this is one that unfortunately crashed and the Germans having a good look at the bomb. So uh, it's saying in here as well about they were painted in um, red oxide. Here's the stories about the rear spotlight. People talk about the rear spotlight. Where was it? Where was it fitted and everything? Some say it was fitted in the rear, um, the rear bomb bay fairing. But if it had been fitted there, it would have been impossible to get to the inside of it to adjust it. So they're saying in here it's probably fitted into that position there just behind the um, where the uh, ventral gun went. Here we can see it. this is a very common photo that lots of people have seen. You've got the drive pulley there for the upkeep bomb for spinning it. And you've got the camera and then we've got the um, the whip aerial TR11438, the whip aerial for which is prominent in this photo for the TR1143 VHF radio. You can see there the, um, the cable cutters there and we've got the air intakes as well. So going over the page we've got ED915 AJQ Queenie Chuck Chuck um, did not take part in chastise, having developed mechanical problems just prior to take off. The forward end of the bomb bay was enclosed by two fairings with three great big hinges. You can see them there. Um, and then here we are, ED915 AJQ is there. And they've got the little panda bear on the side there with a nice cream carry and a bomb. And you can see here there's one of the modeler's notes, which is great. Here they're talking about damage. They had damage from the splash. You can see debris coming off the aircraft there where the splashed water has hit the aircraft and damaged it. Some beautiful pictures here. Really, really nice. And this is because they had issues with going so low. They fitted an American altimeter system. Uh, AN, APN1, AYD. And you can see the little antenna for it there, a little T-shaped antenna underneath the tail. And then we've got the final picture here. You've got the, uh, this is showing us those um, 
bloke called Nozzle Fairings. And uh, the aircraft with which Les Knight's crew beached the Eder Dam, breached the Eder Dam, is seen here after chastised with Terry Kearns and his crew. Although now sporting a Sabs bomb site, the aircraft is still in upkeep configuration and is seen in company with a Fordson Watt 1 crew bus. Behind. The St. Nose art was applied for Kearns after the dam's raid. So there, a couple of nice pictures there, aren't they? You can see there's that little pulley for the emergency break really, uh, the emergency release for the upkeep bomb. So we're on to the B1 special now, which is really interesting. This was the um, sort of the last Lancaster built really, and this was for carrying the um, the tall boy um, and the Grand Slam, of course. So really, really nice. This one's still got its front turret and upper turret. So I'm assuming this is the development aircraft. I'm assuming because so, it's still got a nose turret, it's still got an upper turret. Most of the B1s had a fair of a turret and no turret there, as you can see here. So um, very, very nice. Got some beautiful images here. PB995 here, all seen here. Auto production B1 special aircraft with fit with taller astrodomes and deepened bomb aimers blisters. So you've got a taller astrodome on there, you can see. And but it's still got the rear turret and the front turret, it's unusual. And we've got a bomb rack there. No, that's the back of the bomb. There is also a they had a it probably talks about there's a bomb rack under there for practice bombs. So here we can see the crew of PD113. And they're also talking here, they've got larger wheels and tires and stronger undercarriage. So I wonder if the HK kit has that. Probably not. Anyway, and then here you can see a tall boy, a uh, uh, Grand Slam being dropped. You can see the, the aircraft shoots upwards. And here you've got the two contrasting camouflage schemes. You've got the day camouflage there and the night camouflage there. Very, very nice. You've got YZC here. And it's showing it's got painted underneath. It's got YZC on the tailplane, and the Z is reversed for some reason. Um, red code letters with yellow outline repeated above and below the tailplane, above and below. Okay, so uh, that's something I've got to do on mine, which is WSY of Nine Squadron. Um, so beautiful image there. You can see they've got some red paint around the. Um, around the uh, fair where they remove the fairing there. So you've got the bomb there with the crutch system holding it up. That's actually a tall boy, isn't it? It looks like a tall boy because the, the rack is in rather than out. That's a grand slam. Yeah, that's a tall boy. You can see there the, uh, the cables they're talking about there. There's three of them together, looking all lovely, resplendent in their different camouflage schemes. You've got a David Brown tractor. Remember, if you want to get any of this, um, you can get all this from Iconic Air. If you look them up, I've done reviews on them. They're absolutely wonderful little resin kits. You can get all of this. You get the rack, the bomb. You can't get a Grand Slam, but you can get a Tall Boy. Uh, maybe he's going to do a Grand Slam, I'm not sure. Um, but you've got the trolley, the bomb, and the, and the tractor there. There's the bomb rack I was talking about. That's the practice bomb rack. You can see that the letters on top of the tailplane, which I've had to have um, have uh, um, stencils made for, sorry, masks made for me, um, because the kits world decals don't include them, which they should. So uh, there we go. And also, if you're doing WSJ, which I'm doing my uh, wing at wings cat has, the lettering is all the wrong shape as well on the kits world decals. So bear that in mind. Um, and here we can see this is the rear turret. They completely removed. The, um, the perspex from the rear of the turret, which gives it a very unusual look side on. It's just completely missing. As you can see, they must have been freezing cold in there. And you can see it there. It's completely missing. So that's interesting. You've got the, day, day, the daytime camouflage there, which looks lovely, doesn't it? Looks so nice. And then here we've got one. Unfortunately, this, uh, this one here came to its end. It apparently was doing some um, high speed, low level trials and it hit the ground. And uh, it subsequently crashed afterwards, or belly landed. And then we've got one here which is looking lovely. And we've got here and here, this is um, 15 Squadrons PD131 LSV, seen better days. Shows a wealth of interesting details. People that tell you pre shading on aircraft is inaccurate, look at that. That looks like pre shading to me. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and you can see the weathering under it's all chipped to hell. Amazing. And there's your window shoot there. 
And then going over the page here, we've got the later Pito tube on that one. This is an emblem um, for 1-5 Squadron. No fuselage serial number visible. That's when you, yeah. And it's got the later, this is white coloured uh, lettering painted on there now. And there's LSV and LSX. That's interesting. Look at the shape of the S. Two different fonts completely. And they actually look bigger on there as well, don't they? That's interesting. Hmm. See, so there's an air intake there for the heater. Um, what's this picture here showing us? Oh, this is without the bomb shackle installed. You can see it's got the uh, tread, the block treaded tires as well. There's LSZ and there's LSX. Lovely aerial photo there. Where are they flying over? Over Lowestoft. So you go if you live in Lowestoft. That's what it used to look like. And then finally, here's a beautiful picture of a Grand Slam attached to the bottom of the uh, Lancaster there. Lovely picture. You can see the great big crutch there holding it in place. Beautiful. Really, really nice. You can see there it's got the anti-shimmy tyre and it's got the oval bomb aimer's window there. Oh, this is nice. Right. Canadians played an unusually large part in this book. Most Mark II squadrons were Canadian, all Mark X squadrons were Canadian, and Canadian aircrew were prominent on 617 Squadron, which flew both the Type 464 and the B1 Special. Even at least one of the handful of Mark VI's to see service was flown by a Canadian Pathfinder Squadron. Sorry, It's probably fitting, therefore, that the author calls this that country his home. This photo shows a 408 Canadian Squadron Lancaster Mark II about to receive its bomb load on a wintry day in Yorkshire. So on that note, we shall say goodbye. That is a beautiful picture there for a diorama. Oh, I do like the look of the B2. It's lovely, isn't it? And there we go. So, thanks very much for watching. If you want to get yourself one of these, get on over to wingleader.co.uk and get yourself ordered one. What a book. For 20 quid, I mean, it's... Like I say, I mean, you think of the price of a pint of beer now, you know, that's, I know beer in my area is quite cheap. I think in London, that's less than three pints of beer there. So, you know, good bit of bedtime reading. It's got 81 pages. It's wonderful. What a book. Go and get yourself one. Thanks for watching. See you all soon. Bye for now.